Great. So um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is November 30th, 2022. It's one o'clock. Can I call this meeting to order? Hope everyone had a restful Thanksgiving. Um, the board did not meet last week, though that certainly didn't stop us from getting some good work done. We have some new guidance documents posted to our website, um, but Kyle is going to walk us through those later today. A uh, huge thank you to our licensing and compliance teams for hosting a live Q&A session last week. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined and that brought their good questions and kept the discussion civil. Um, you know, no one has really figured out how to regulate their cannabis markets perfectly right out of the gate. Every state takes a different approach with respect to their laws, their market structure, their testing protocols, et cetera. Um, this inevitably means that there's a steep learning curve and some confusion, both among regulators and licensees at the outset. Um, and we really do need to learn from each other. Um, we provide guidance where there's ambiguity and we are continually assessing what's working and what's not. I think the Q&A session seemed very productive in achieving these goals. The recording's available uh, at our YouTube page um, and we are actively discussing internally um, when and how to do more of these. We have a lot to get through today, but I would like to take a moment to note that tomorrow is World AIDS Day. People living with HIV were some of the earliest advocates in speaking truth to power about the therapeutic effects of cannabis. I know in Vermont, we would not have a medical program and likely not an adult use program without this community's determination and sacrifice. Thank you for all the bravery and hope you share with the world every day. A quick administrative note, we have a new rule waiver request form. As a reminder, the CCB built a little bit of flexibility in designing our regulations um, to reduce or waive certain requirements on a case-by-case -case basis. This new form is an effort to centralize and streamline the waiver requests, request process. It's available at ccbe.vermont.gov slash rule waiver. Moving forward, all waiver requests other than packaging waiver requests must be submitted through this form. Packaging waivers um, have a unique set of circumstances and considerations and still need to go through the packaging form that's available on our guidance page. I would just add a word of caution. Uh, the CCB spent a lot of time contemplating whether each and every regulation was in service to our core mission. So um, our granting a waiver to any regulation um, has been and will continue to be the rare exception rather than the rule. So other than that, just need to approve the minutes from our last meeting on November 16th, 2022. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Kyle, I think we're turning to you now for uh, um, some guidance walkthroughs. All righty, <clears throat> love this up. So I'm just gonna walk everybody through um, the what can I do with my cannabis two pager that um, we put out on our website last week. I think it's important for <clears throat> every one of our licensed um, <clears throat> folks, whether it's a cultivator or retailer, understands what they can and can't do at least at a 30,000 foot view with their respective license. And I know that there's been some questions or some confusion that's come out of some of the words that we've used um, on this two pager. And I think it's important to remember, um, you know, these words are intentional. A lot are in our definitions um, in our rules or, or in statute. So let's start with the cultivator license. A cultivator licensees may grow cannabis plants either outdoor, indoors, or a mix of indoors and outdoors. Cultivators may also dry cannabis, package it, create pre-rolls out of flower and or trim, and sell it to other cannabis establishments. 
They may produce clones for sale to other licensees, including licensed retail establishments. I know there's been some questions about that. People have seen clones at retail establishments. That is per perfectly fine. Cultivators may not conduct any extraction, including mechanical extraction. This means extraction by means of mechanical or manual sifting and press, uh, pressing as approved by the board. This includes sifting for Keef. Um, you need to get a manufacturer's license if you want to do that intentionally. If not, it's gonna end up in your trim and you'll package it uh, in your pre-rolls or however else you decide to work with your trim product. You may also not possess cannabis products. Now, I think that there's been some confusion around this. Folks need to remember that cannabis and cannabis products are two different things under our regulations. Cannabis in and of itself implies through our regulations, flower or pre-rolls. Cannabis products means those that flower has undergone some other type of process or extraction and is a little bit more concentrated. You know, and I know that there's folks out there <clears throat> that um, are wondering, hey, I'm trying to, I'm working with a manufacturer to turn my flower into a manufactured product. Why can't I re take repossession of that um, as I look to distribute it, uh, you know, to retailers? And, you know, one, that's a, that's a business uh, arrangement that you can make with a manufacturer to kind of move that product for you or on your behalf. You can still carry your brand name, your label, your branding, whatever you want to call it on that product that that manufacturer has in effect turned into a cannabis product for you. And, and this is on par with how every other state uh, more or less uh, treats cannabis products. Um, you're required to either do that or seek an additional license, a wholesale license or a manufacturer license to take repossession of those cannabis products. And this was the legislative intent. If you look through our statutes of how the legislature thought that this supply chain would work in a linear fashion. I think, you know, we all know both Folks listening and us at the table recognize that this is not always a linear supply chain. And as we update the legislature on how things are going, I'm sure we'll have um, conversations to see if any adjustments to you know that cannabis product and who can possess them, if any adjustments should be made. But I just want to make folks aware that a product and flower are two distinct things under our regulations. Can I make a just Something to that, Absolutely. when we say they may not, may not possess cannabis products, that means under their license. It doesn't mean that the person can't separately participate in the cannabis market as a consumer. Absolutely. You are, you are welcome to participate as you so desire, so long as you're 21. And as I said, cultivators may make arrangements with manufacturers to have the cultivator's label put on cannabis products that are manufactured with the cultivator's plant material. And if you want more information, this is a live link. You can go look at our, our rules that kind of further elaborate on this 2.3, 2.4, and 2.5, in addition to the statutory charges and that legislative intent with which we interpreted um, to create these rules. This is not the time for questions, but thank you. Wholesaler license. Uh, wholesaler licensees may purchase cannabis and cannabis products from other licensees and sell them to licensees. They may package cannabis and cannabis products and may create pre-rolls out of flower and or trim. They may not sell to the general public. Testing laboratory license, testing lab license. Okay, make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. Uh, testing laboratory licensees test cannabis and cannabis products obtained from a licensed cannabis establishment, dispensary, or a member of the public. All cannabis and cannabis products sold must be tested in accordance with board rules. Testing laboratories test for product potency and purity across a variety of metrics. They may not sell cannabis to the general public or to other licensees. And again, if you have any questions, these are live links. You can, you can do your own investigating as to what we specifically say in rule and look to the legislature and their intent as we interpreted it. A manufacturer license. Manufacturer license, licensees may create products from cannabis plants, including edibles, oils, tinctures, and other such products. There are three tiers of manufacturing licenses depending on the type of extraction methods used and amount sold. Tier three manufacturers may use any lawful method of extraction, including supercritical CO2 extraction, <coughs> solvent chemical extraction, and flammable solvent chemical synthesis. Tier one and tier two manufacturers may use the following extraction methods. Mechanical extraction, as I talked about uh, previously, 
water-based extraction, which is extraction using only ice, water, or other freezing sub substrate or process as approved by the board, food-based extraction using propylene glycol, glycerin, butter, coconut, or olive oil, other type of cooking fats, or alcohol as approved by the board, or heat and pressure-based extraction. Manufacturers can pro package their products and sell them to other cannabis establishments. Again, they cannot sell to the general public. A retailer license. They purchase cannabis and cannabis products from other licensees, and they may package and sell cannabis and cannabis products to the general public. Only retail licenses and the retail portion of integrated licenses may sell to the general public. Last but not least, our integrated license, um, they may engage in activities of each of the license types, cultivation, manufacturing, wholesale testing, and retail. And these licenses are only available to an applicant and its affiliates that hold a medical cannabis program dispensary registration on April 1st, 2022. So, you know, that's really it from this two pager. Um, we're hopeful this kind of gives folks um, who have any outstanding questions about what they can do um, some type of clarity. Um, I recognize it's pretty high level and questions as they continue to arise, we'll respond to them. I, I think it's important to note also that a cannabis establishment refers to any of our license types. Cannabis establishment is not just a cultivator, it's not just a retailer, it's not just a manufacturer. It's kind of a, a general term that we use in reference to anybody who's licensed uh, by the board. So that's it for that. <clears throat> Brandon, did you want to do the, the ball flower? Sure. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so as the chair mentioned, uh, at the outset, we had a Q&A session last week um, after hours that some of the CCB staff participated in. Um, there were a number of great questions that came up at that event. Um, as the chair mentioned, it is recorded um, and it's available on our YouTube page. So feel free to check it out. Um, one of the questions or issues that kind of, that came up quite a bit in that session um, had to do with registering flower um, and the nuances of registering flower. So um, it was clear that we needed to provide a little bit more clarity about um, registering flower and in particular registering bulk flower. So um, we put together a guidance document um, that tries to clarify these questions a little bit and I'll just pull it up and go through it quickly. So essentially, there are two ways to register your flower. Um, as, as we've uh, described in our the product registration process, typically all different types of product um, need to have their own separate product registration. Um, this gets a little bit tricky with flower. So if you are um, prepackaging your flower, um, each different strain or cultivar of that flower has to be um, under a separate product registration. Again, if it is prepackaged for retail sale. Um, one of the nuances that came up during the Q&A session um, is cultivators who are registering their own flower. Um, and if so if you're a cultivator that wants to prepackage um, and brand your own flower um, and also register your pre-rolls that are made with the same cultivar or process lot as the flower that you're packaging um, for retail sale, you can submit one registration application for both um, your prepackaged flower and your prepackaged pre rolls. As long as you include in your registration application um, the different packaging that you'll be using for both your flower and for your pre rolls. So um, if you take a look at our website, the product registration page, there are instructions for how to include information about your packaging requirements. So as long as you include um, that information about the packaging for both the flower and the pre-rolls, you can submit one registration application for both. So that is um, pre-packaged and branded flower. Um, the other thing that's happening is that retail shops are carrying bulk flower. Um, and that bulk flower is changing um, relatively frequently based on um, how many People are coming in to buy it, but um, there's quite a bit of turnover, I think, with the different strains of flour that retailers are getting in. So in an effort to make it um, an easier process for retailers to carry and sell bulk flour, um, we're only requiring that bulk flour have one product registration. 
So any retailer that wants to um, have a bulk flower program, sell, sell bulk flower, um, only has to submit one product registration mm -hmm. for that um, bulk flower program. So um, retailers can sell any cultivar um, that comes from any cultivator under that one product registration. So what we're asking for retailers to do if they want to sell bulk flour is to submit a registration application for their bulk flour um, that includes the proposed packaging for their bulk flour, a warning label, and an initial um, certificate of analysis. And then um, they have to sell that flour uh, in a child deterrent reusable container um, that complies with all of the relevant packaging and labeling requirements. Um, many retailers are already doing this, um, providing reusable uh, bulk flour containers um, and offering customers to bring them back for refills. Um, the CCB is really encouraging retailers to do this as long as um, that reuse container reuse program um, contains the following elements, which I will go through here. So. I was just going to say, yeah. and very quickly, Brynn, just for anybody who, who may be slightly confused at the, the term bulk flour, this is deli style packaging. I think we're trying to move in a, calling it bulk flour direction and away from deli style, but just for anybody who's maybe not caught on to that yet, I no, just wanted to clarify. Yep. So bulk flour is really um, when retailers receive <clears throat> flour uh, from a cultivator or from a wholesaler and are packaging it at the point of sale. That is what we mean by bulk flour. So if retailers want to um, have a container reuse program for their bulk flour, they have to ensure that their containers that they're providing for their bulk flour meet the requirements of the rule, including that the container be child deterrent and maintain that child deterrence with reuse. Um, retailers can only refill containers that they originally supplied to the consumer for bulk flour. Um, when a consumer purchases bulk flour, the retailer has to provide the cultivar name, um, the potency information, and the COA for pathogens and pesticide residues that correspond to that specific bulk flour that the consumer purchased. And then to ensure the integrity of the child deterrent container, retailers would have to make sure um, that the container that the customer brings back is still child deterrent. And if it's not, um, they have to replace the container or a portion of the container um, so that it remains child deterrent. And then lastly, the retailer has to ensure that the warning label um, on the container is still legible when it's refilled. And if it is not legible, replace it. And the board plans to conduct retail inspections to ensure that um, retailers are operating in compliance with the guidance for their bulk flower registrations. That's it. Great. <clears throat> Any questions or comments or Bryn? Just, just very briefly, I know a lot of folks have moved um, in a packaging direction, um, utilizing the one um, child deterrent bag for flour that we've, uh, you know, allowed or granted a, a waiver for. Um, and, and so something to think about for retailers that are interested in, in doing this, you know, if you sell flour in that bag after it's been torn and ripped and used that first time it loses its child deterrent capabilities if you read the definition of child deterrent so um again i'm always encouraging folks to move away from our waivers and into glass packaging i think it fits perfectly with what we're trying to do here um, i'm sure folks that have used these bags consumers that are bringing those bags back to the store may just want their bag to be refilled um, but we're going to have to see in a plan that you submit, as Bryn mentioned, um, how you intend to, um, you know, meet that child deterrent with those bags. Those bags are designed to break down easily. A use or two, the bag's going to start falling apart. Um, I don't know if they're engineered to do what the bulk flower intends to do. And, and it's really hoping folks can figure out a way to move beyond that waiver, which will uh, go away eventually unless we reauthorize it and, and move towards other types of packaging and start really focusing on reusing a lot of the packaging um, that's out there. That's all I got. All right. 
Um, so next on the agenda is a walkthrough of proposed rule changes. Um, I'd just like to say a few words before we start this process. Um, you know, what has been happening is every time we have a public comment session or any time we kind of notice something about our rules that isn't working or could be improved upon or needs to be changed, David, our general counsel, keeps track of those. Um, you know, we intend to update our rules every year, um, you know, to keep them current, to keep them relevant, to keep them useful. Um, and uh, what we're going to do today is review the changes that David has been keeping track of. Um, and uh, this is not the kind of, this is the starting line of our rule change process. Um, I know that, you know, whenever we kind of reopen a rule and, you know, it feels kind of like it's going to be there forever. It's etched in stone. It's not, it's not the case. And, and this really um, is going to be a continuous iterative uh, kind of process. And um, I don't know, David, I know I didn't ask you uh, in advance, but maybe you could kind of talk about at the appropriate time what the next steps in the administrative whole process processes are um, or procedure act so that um, Anyone who's listening um, can understand where we where we are when we decide to reopen a rule. Yeah, I'll do that right now, and then we'll jump into the edits if that makes sense. So I can keep it brief. I mean, we'll there's a series of filings that we have to do um, in order to promulgate a rule, in order to make a rule become a real regulation that that has the force of law. One of the procedures, though, or one of the steps in those filings is that we are required to get public comment. And those of us who, um, those of you all who are listening who were involved with this earlier this year uh, will remember that. Um, there is a huge amount of public comment at that time. I'm sure we'll have more this time. The board welcomes it. The board made a lot of changes as a result of those public comments. So um, as you go through this is, just remember, this is the first draft. There are going to be more changes, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity for public input, both through our portal, on our website, or we'll have a meeting where there will be uh, opportunity for people just, that will be dedicated to just receiving verbal public comments that people want to make. So there's going to be a lot of time um, and opportunity for input, and that's required by law. We couldn't, the board can't not do that. So that will be happening. And I, ex I don't know exactly when, but I'd expect that that'll probably be early February. Um, and, and the, the co public comment period has to extend for 30 days, so there'll be time. But I, I expect that 30-day period will be somewhere around, like, starting in late January. Um, so anyway, that's a little overview. Um, <clears throat> and I'll jump in. Um, Today's like a soft day. <laughs> don't so you know in light of that you may see things you like may see things you don't like other things that we should change um don't feel like if you don't get your comments in at our 10 minute public comment session at the end of this meeting that they won't be heard it may be better that you submit those written or in our uh, meetings that are designed specifically to go over public comment so That's exactly right. Thanks. So we're closer together. All right, so as you'll see as we're going through this, um, some of these changes are, are substantive changes that I think will have an impact. A lot of them are not particularly substantive. They're really technical things, but we'll identify that as we go through. So the first one you'll see, this is really a technical change. Employee, this definition was intended to um, apply only to the positive impact criteria section, having it here potentially introduce some confusion about who is required to get uh, the employee ID cards. We didn't intend to do that. So anyway, technical change here. That definition is still in the rule, but it's been its place has been changed. Uh, outdoor cultivation definition is changing. I would say this is more of a substantive change. Um, so I'll just read out what the proposal is. Outdoor cultivation means growing cannabis in a manner that does not use artificial lighting 
Provided that outdoor cultivators may use the minimum amount of artificial lighting necessary to keep photo period plants in a vegetative state, artificial lighting for outdoor cultivation must not extend beyond May 1st in a calendar year or past when the specific cultivar can sustain vegetative growth under natural sunlight, whichever comes first. And also I should say, you know, you guys pipe up whenever. Um, so moving on to the social equity section, uh, these first couple edits are really just making explicitly clear uh, something that the board has, uh, this is how the board has applied this rule and has interpreted it already, but I think we're just sort of clarifying, which is that incarceration really means in a jail or prison facility subsequent to sentencing. So pretrial detentions aren't, um, will not count and don't count currently. The board has interpreted incarceration to mean what this says, but we felt like it made sense to clarify by uh, putting this in the rule. There's a number of tiny little changes here around making sure the sections all agree. This subsection, new subsection or subdivision two here, I would put this more as a technical change. This is really just making clear that an individual who meets any of the three criteria up here could constitute uh, an owner for the purpose of um, comprising a social equity business. And so there was a little bit of a gap there that was not intended. Um, and we've been interpreting the rule to mean this, but again, this is really just making explicitly clear that any of the three ways in which you might be a social equity applicant mean that that counts towards the ownership stake in a social equity business. So one of the areas of social equity that's been a point of discussion, and I think it's fair to say some, some confusion uh, over the, this initial period has been the third social equity criteria, which says that if you're from a community that's been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, and you're able to demonstrate to the board that you are personally harmed by that disproportionate impact, then you could be a social in, uh, social equity applicant. So with the changes here, we are trying to clarify what this means. And I think this is a, a significant change. I would also say that in many ways, it really is just trying to put on paper how the board has interpreted this again. So I'm not actually sure that its impact is going to sort of change who makes it through this gate, but I think it's just trying to clarify what was intended uh, when this was originally written. Um, so there's a slight change there around the uh, long-term consequences, sort of trying to state that a little more plainly. I think the bigger piece obviously is this new paragraph that says, for the purposes of this subsection, community includes, but is not limited to, a person who spent the majority of their youth prior to, prior to turning 18 in a household that was eligible for FDPIR or that received SNAP benefits. And FDPIR is essentially the equivalent to SNAP benefits, but it is uh, for individuals on Indian reservations. Um, or that, or sorry, I didn't finish out that sentence before I started saying that or that receives SNAP or lives in a household that is eligible for or that receives SNAP benefits currently. Um, for the purposes of this subsection, community does not mean professional or civic associations, social organizations, clubs, advocacy organizations, or hobbyist groups. A prior association with cannabis is not by itself sufficient to constitute community. So again, we're trying really to clarify what the intention was here and in fact clarify how the board has been interpreting this. I think, you know, the board has stated publicly some of these concepts already, um, and we're just trying to put them in the rule itself so that we can have more clarity and, and individuals trying to understand what is a complicated piece of the rule um, can understand it more easily just by reading the rule. Uh, the applicability section, this is a bit of a uh, substantive thing. So the legislature in the most recent most recent session this earlier this year did give to the board significant authority to excuse me um, regulate hemp derived products and so this clarifies that excuse me persons who engage in the transfer or sale of hemp derived products that contain more than one milligram of THC per serving are subject to this rule 
<laughs> Thank you. Sorry. The fact that we all have the same cough is a testament to how much time we spend together. <laughs> all right, I'll get through this eventually. So this section is really um, <clears throat> the clarification. Excuse me, <laughs> lost my voice entirely. This was <clears throat> always how we've interpreted this, but again, Clarifying a crop has to be <clears throat> the entirety of the crop has to be within two spans. That was for mixed cultivators. Um, this is uh, again <coughs> how the rule's been interpreted, but supercritical CO2 extraction um, is not something that's permitted for a tier two manufacturer. <clears throat> I also deleted the word unapproved. So there's never an intention to um, routinely carve out exceptions for tier two manufacturers. It was just, this is the stuff that's reserved for tier three. <clears throat> this is a substantive change where um, tier one outdoor cultivators could have a more, have an easier path to moving up a tier. To a higher outdoor tier, I should say. This is a bit of clarification <clears throat> around escrow. Just clarifying that it needs to be a third party that's holding the account. We got rid of the word bond because I think it was confusing. Nobody's used it when we were asked what we meant by that. I don't think we were really able to explain it all that well. <laughs> so, and I don't think we had clarity on why exactly that was in there. That term is usually used in relation to like securities and things like that. And so it didn't make a lot of sense. Obviously we will take public input if somebody had an idea for what that, how that may have been fit in there. This is where that employee definition went, landed here, because this is what it was intended to apply to. One thing that is a substantive change here, um, for retailers, a plan to, put, uh, to pay the applicable taxes on behalf of medical patient registered pursuant to where they need to be registered may count toward one of the criteria that they, that would otherwise need, they would otherwise need to meet in this section. And this is that positive impact criteria section, as I just said. Um, that licensees need to meet if they have more than a certain number of employees. This isn't a particularly substantive change. It just made sense to restate this given the sort of new board responsibilities around CBD and hemp derived <laughs> products. Um, and to say a little bit more about that, the legislation did require the board to come up with a plan for dealing with those products in the new year in January. So that'll be presented <clears throat> publicly into the legislature at that time. Um, but that uh, does not, there isn't currently anything. Um, if people are wondering and you haven't seen it, it's because it doesn't exist at this time. This is a change to acknowledge that the uh, $50,000, this is really a statutory requirement um, that had to be accomplished by October 1st of this year. And that is passed and behind us, so it didn't make sense to keep that in the rule. So, or I should say it didn't make sense to have that specific piece in the rule. A plan to contribute will remain as one of the things that should be there. Yeah, and this is us putting into 
the rule, the ways in which the board has been interpreting the rule. So for overcoming a presumptive disqualification, a person will be deemed qualified if the board finds that granting them a license will not pose a threat to the safety of the legal cannabis market or the general public. And that's really the framework with it, with, within which the board has already been operating. Um, but it made sense to just state that plainly so folks know uh, what the bar is. The general public knows what the bar is that needs to be met. Lots of things aren't changing, as you can see. <laughs> so we had a provision in there regarding change of location or change of license control. Um, and some of the sort of specificity and tightness of the rules around this is to make sure that there is no violation of the one license per type rule, which is really like one of the key uh, aspects of the legislation as it was designed by the legislature, and we wanted to make sure we held that closely. But as experience, experience has taught us <clears throat> that it doesn't necessarily make sense in every case to require a full-on license renewal for every possible change in control, because there are some very small ones that where it doesn't make sense to do that. <clears throat> so this is just acknowledging that and saying, we're not going to do it in every case, but everybody still has to notify us when they are going to have a change of control. Um, yeah, so let's go to this, and I'll open this up for board discussion. There had been some interest, excuse me, among the board members in thinking about the waiver provisions. Um, so if, if you want to have a quick discussion now, and I can pull up the provisions. Um, or have this in a way where you can see both the list and the provisions. But um, yeah, I will open up the discussion for you guys. So just for the purpose of orientation, you know, these are the rule one <clears throat> waivers that we wrote into our rule um, that waive specific aspects of our regulations if you are a tier one cultivator, whether that's indoor, outdoor, or mixed. Uh, we took significant public comment um, about which regulations just are not necessary for tier one cultivators. We tried to capture them in this section. Um, and now I think is the perfect time to reopen that discussion now that we have a little bit of experience under our belt. So are there any uh, in particular? Yeah, I'm just reminding myself which which sections align with which numbers? <laughs> so these are the first two right here, G and H of 1.4.2. Oh, okay. And let me know if you want to skip down. <clears throat> so it seems like upon renewal, we would want people to put um, in their renewal application um, a description of any criminal action or a description of any civil action, particularly if it's happened since they were <laughs> licensed. I mean, they do have a responsibility to keep us informed, but it should be part of the renewal process. I'm fine with that. I, I actually, when in reviewing this, couldn't remember our rationale for waiving those other than we didn't want to necessarily re-traumatize someone. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, so maybe it is that we say that you have to give a description of anything that's happened since your since the issuance of your license. Yeah, that would make sense. That sounds good. I think it. I think at least it's you know, majority of those waivers that are in there are from 1.4.4, which are compliance and management plans. And just something, I know I'm I'm thinking about. Um, I think we waived a lot of those to try and capture as, as many folks. I shouldn't say the word capture. Bring along as many folks as we possibly could. Get them licensed. Get them growing. Get their products into the market. And I think. You know, one of the things that I, I feel is important, and I hope everybody who is listening also feels similarly, is now that you, you know, some are getting their licenses today, but we've had some licenses that have been granted for four, five, six months, is looking at your business and how do you get smarter and start planning for the long term as a business. And a lot of these waivers, um, to me, feel as though they're, they're the, the beginnings of a 
compliance plan, a business plan, you know, how you but look to make sure that it's now that you Sorry, that was distracting. <laughs> how how you're looking to um, move forward as as a business, whether you're trying to grow up a tier or, you know, just make sure you have long term viability um, and what that means to you. So I think, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to imply I want to strike all of those waiver provisions without further conversation or discussion. But I think it's it's worth noting that we want folks to you know, continue to find success. And that's not just success on that first initial sale that you've already made, but how can you keep the success as this market um, starts to, to mature? So can we look at those, David? Yeah, sorry. Let me... <clears throat> Here is 1.4.4. It was everything but D, I think, was waived here. Um. Yeah, it seems like A, once somebody's got a year under their belt, should have a plan for dispersal disposal of inventory. They have 125 plants. We'd like to know where it's going to go if they decide not to continue to operate. So are you suggesting that that only apply to renewal? Renewal, yeah. not, not, to, yeah. um, not to initial licensure? Yeah, I'm focused. I think that makes sense to me. I think if we're thinking about renewal or we've made it, I think, you know, through what we've already talked about, a little easier for folks to move up a tier from an outdoor tier one to a, a different tier. Obviously, these waivers wouldn't apply, but I think even on renewal, getting folks thinking this way, if that's in their two year <coughs> plan, you know what I mean? You know, compliance and management plans and business plans are important for anybody to maintain their business yes i have been thinking about this in terms of renewal okay. yeah. so would you be <clears throat> wanting to have all of these kick back in for renewal upon like for a renewal of a license yeah except for have... b which is a submitted timeline for beginning of operations okay. but yes yeah, i think so okay I feel like, you know, some of it, and I don't know how we word it, I, I feel like it's some of it's contingent on whether or not that tier one outdoor cultivator has any employees, because we waived a lot of overviews of, unless I'm looking at the wrong numbers, like E, F, G, we waived all that. Folks may have hired somebody to help them between licensure and now. I think we'd want to see that, but that might be understanding on renewal who is working for your business if it's anybody but yourself right yes Unless I'm no i mistaken. think that's right i think that's right i mean if it's a sole proprietorship we wouldn't need any of that information and i don't think that's too much of a lift for i would hope that's not too much of a lift for our small cultivators but i think what it can help do if folks approach it the right way is starting to get smarter as a business as we want them to succeed Okay. <clears throat> that was helpful, David, in terms of <laughs> turning. No, I, I think I think we've been at it over the last year and a half. So I can put it. <laughs> I mean, one thing that we're seeing that for for C, a test they'll comply with applicable municipal ordinances, is that there is a lot of confusion as to what, both on the municipal side and on the licensee side, as to what's the applicable the municipal <laughs> ordinance, what's legal and what's not. So I, I hate to have someone attest only to find out, hey, like what we thought at the time is not what we think now. You so know, maybe we should leave that one. I think we should leave that one out okay. in tier one. And just to be sure that I'm <clears throat> clear, so we're leaving is the same for initial licensure. We're talking about renewal, but even for renewal, BMC will not be required. That's right. Okay. Public comment. I have no doubt. See how folks feel about that. And some of it could depend on any statutory changes too, right? That might happen. Well, let's sure. yeah. say the legislature does decide that all the cultivators can be in. Some cool stuff kind of makes impact there too. <laughs> Are we creating a Frankenstein monster here? I mean, between initial <laughs> and is this unmanageable? Um, I'm just thinking about how long it may take us to change the application. Um, and 
it may take longer than how long it's going to take to get these rules amended. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't do it. Um, just mean. Well, let's keep that in the back of our minds when we start making dis determinations between initial and renewal, because I think yeah. that's where the complication will come. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think this is, from my perspective, hoping to help people get smarter as a business. We all know that business and technical assistance in the cannabis space is hard to come by, at least right now. Um, so anything I feel like we can do to ask people to think that way, I think would benefit folks upon renewal in year two, three, four, and do whenever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then the next one <clears throat> is the escrow requirement in 1.4.5b, which right now just doesn't apply to tier one. Um, <clears throat> keep it the same or? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Okay. I think the next ones will get there eventually um, are the wastewater requirements. Yeah. It's these two, the um, wetter certifying the capacity to both provide the water and deal with the wastewater. And, the, and then these are exempted only as to home occupancy businesses. I think I'm fine leaving that as is. Yep. Sounds great. All right, so that's rule one. You wanna take a break? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> let me get a couple more cough drops to make it through rule two. Sorry. Oh. Please. That might be enough. Okay. <laughs> While you're pulling that up, I'll just say one more time that, um, this, this is not final. These are the things that we've noticed, we've heard about the most. Um, and uh, throughout the kind of next stages of this process, we have ample opportunity for people to, to bring new rule changes to us that can be included in this year's amendments. Um, you know, if people want to see other things waived for tier one cultivators, you know, there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to kind of provide that information to the board and can be included um, in, in our kind of this year's, this coming year's rule amendments. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's good to point out. Your comments don't need to be specifically tailored to the changes we're trying to make. You can suggest things as well. That's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> all right, so in rule two, got some definition changes here or additions really. Um, defining clone means plant section from a female cannabis plant, not yet root bound, growing in a water solution, solution which is capable of developing into a new plant. Distillate means a concentrate where a segment of canna cannabinoids from an initial extraction are segregated through heating and cooling with all impurities removed. Full spectrum means a cannabis concentrate product or infused product that is derived from a cannabis concentrate, contains cannabinoids, aromatics, essential vitamins, vitamins and minerals, fatty acids, protein, chlorophyll, flavonoids, and terpenes, and has not been reformulated or has not had cannabinoid isolates or distillates added to it. <clears throat> uh, the harvest lot definition has changed, although again, as you'll see a theme of this, is that a lot of these changes are really just sort of modifying how the board has been interpreting and enforcing this stuff already. Um, and that is true here too. Harvest thought means cannabis grown in the same manner. Uh, whoops, that is a um, that is a typo. Sorry about that. So what this is going to say is harvest lot means um, that basically the get that first sentence just shouldn't be there. I don't believe. I'm going to check with our with Carrie, our uh, compliance person. But I think this is a uh, um, co co copy paste problem, but it, the, the basic concept is that um, to meet the criteria for a har single harvest lot, a given lot of cannabis would need to be on the same flowering, fertilizer, and pesticide application schedule. Single 
harvest lot and they contain one or multiple cultivars of cannabis. Um, so it is different than what it was before, uh, which was, yeah, it was defined differently. This is how it is currently being applied. Um, and I will confirm to make sure that this is what uh, Carrie had intended on this piece, but that is harvest lot. Oh, Carrie, uh, you know, maybe we should allow for a... <laughs> Carrie? What do you want? Jump I, was, I was just going to give you a thumbs up, David. That that looks good. That's oh, what great. We're That's good news. Thanks, Carrie. I, I lost confidence there. <clears throat> um, isolate means a cannabis concentrate that is more than 98% comprised of a single cannabinoid compound created by a chemical process. And then this outdoor cultivation change, which is the same thing that I just read in the prior rule, so I won't reread it, but it is the, it was, yeah, we changed the uh, definition of outdoor cultivation in everywhere. Process lot means whole or partial harvest lots that follow different paths towards market or diverted into waste. For example, a single harvest lot would be broken into two process lots of half of sold fresh frozen to a manufacturer and half was dried, cured, and sold as bulk flour to a retailer. Tincture means a solvent such as alcohol or glycerin infused with cannabis. A tincture may include additional plant material. Tinctures may be sold in any volume, but the total milligrams of THC per container must not exceed 500 milligrams. And then this was changed to reflect that change in rule one um, that states that hemp-derived products with more than one milligram of THC per serving are required to get licensed pursuant to Rule 1. And this just allows that to agree. Um, so these changes up here are to the tiers uh, are mostly just correcting errors where the tiers had been uh, not put in correctly. In the original rule, uh, they didn't meet the legislation, or they didn't match the legislation, I should say. So now they match the legislation. Um, and then tier one manufacturers and tier one, or the one change, I guess, is the tier one manufacturers were dropped down to this section, which only requires 10,000 in escrow for the if you can't get insurance. And then, <clears throat> Again, having a third party requirement for that escrow account, and then noting that this escrow account, as well as the cessation of operations escrow account that's in rule one, um, may be dispersed only in accordance with guidance issued by the board, and that guidance will be forthcoming, but that's just to make sure that there's a clear understanding of when the escrow accounts can be accessed. So I think one thing we've all talked about is decreasing the cessation of operations escrow like that happens in guidance, just as a reminder. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so we have a number of changes to the warning labels. Um, First change is to the health warning label. And I will note that there is definitely going to be further input on this, as, as Julie's talked about. Um, in other, when we were working on this before, we are required to consult with the Department of Health. We will be getting more input from them, I'm sure, mm -hmm. on this piece. That has to happen still. So this is, a, I'd almost say, a bit of a placeholder, but it is a sort of an initial proposal for how the health warning might change. Uh, it's a bit shorter, as you can see. It's half as long. Half as long. Almost exactly. Um, and then a couple more points of clarification on it. <clears throat> um, when there's multiple layers of packaging, the label must appear on the base layer. Yep. Um, and it does say, yeah, so it's all, it says up here, no smaller than six point font. But if you do go down to six point font, uh, letters should be capitalized, must be capitalized. We change the health warning and people have like 10,000 units with pre-printed with that warning. Is there a... We can use the waiver provision to just say that if you already 
um, use your existing inventory. Exactly. Yeah. Figure it out. I think. It could be a run fit that big label on there. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So I would expect some folks. And just of note, um, all this came from the ASTM guidance oh, that they're working on. In the ASTM, <laughs> it contains cannabis symbol as well. Just they did. Like it was yellow. Right? yellow. Yeah. yeah. And we did not go with that one, although we, we just certainly could. Now. Department of Health, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. Um, so this looks different but it is actually almost all the same i just it was hard to read it was in an image the the directions for how to put this <clears throat> these warnings were in little images beneath the warnings and so i just pulled them out of there and put them into normal type a little bit easier to read there's one change in there where there the word optional had been included when it really wasn't supposed to be there that's the only substantive change everything else is the same Added some clarifications here that these two warnings both need to be on the marketing layer of packaging, and then this one adds the words and pets. This change is <clears throat> an, an interesting one. There's been a lot of confusion around advertising, especially around social media. Um, and this change just specifies, um, say, eliminates um, this prohibition on any other images or text regarding products. This is purely like, <clears throat> excuse me, I might just go get some other pop medicine should we pause for a minute sure why don't we uh just what do you think like three minute break Is yeah that right? sorry for my infirmity here no that's all right that's we'll all come right. back at two o'clock all right <clears throat> see how this goes so it's two o'clock by the way back oh sorry yes thank you but the one other thing i just want to note on the <clears throat> social media accounts it's important to remember that all the other advertising restrictions do apply to social media it's not like there's any elimination of that stuff. It was just this extra piece creating a lot of confusion. <clears throat> and I'd and I'd say there even internally, there is a lack of clarity. And so eliminating it and just relying on the other regulations around advertising made sense. Uh, this piece quick here slide. Really <clears throat> Look, David, really quickly before you uh, go much further, you'll have to reshare your screen. I popped up the meeting break image, which I think pirated screen sharing. Oh. It'll unplug and replug. Gotcha. Thanks, Nelly. All right. How's that looking? Hopefully that's, that's good. Great, thank you. <clears throat> this piece of yours really is just a grammatical thing to make it agree with the sentence at the top, <clears throat> but no substantive change there. <clears throat> this is a substantive change. Um, there's been a prohibition on retail establishments co-locating, um, but this does allow for co-location for retailers um, if a retailer is providing mentorship or accelerator, a mentorship or accelerator program for another. So product licensing is what the statute calls product registration. Um, so <laughs> there's going to be some confusion about this. We can figure out how to deal with that issue. I, for, for now, the rule will use the statutory terminology and we can figure out how to <clears throat> clarify that that's what we're talking about. Um, this is in case there are unanticipated uh, changes in terms of new license types coming out, just saying that the board will uh, establish security requirements for those license types if that happens. Um, this clarifies the one location rule for all establishments. And again, this is really in the nature of putting on paper how the board's been interpreting this. And we're just 
continuing to use the two abutting span rule. So as long as your um, establishment is within two abutting spans, that will count as a single location. <clears throat> this does add a requirement that the uh, for cultivator packaging that will be packaged for consumer purchase needs to include the license number and process lot number, the cultivator's license number and the process lot number. This just, re instead of naming the license types that a sample could go to, it just says another licensee. Um, <clears throat> There are still some statutory limitations on how flour and products can be sort of transferred through the supply chain. Um, I, I, that may or may not change in legislation, but this is just to make sure that there's no more um, limitation on that under the rules and legislation may uh, eliminate it entirely, but we didn't want to have that limitation in the rules. Just samples should be able to flow through the supply chain in a way that makes sense for whatever commercial reasons. We did add this. <clears throat> um, you know, it is currently the case and will remain the case that cultivators who uh, can obviously continue to grow some plants for personal use, just as anybody in the, in the state of Vermont can, uh, we wanted to clarify how that should operate when you're also running a licensed operation. So we have here, a cultivator may grow cannabis for their personal use in accordance with the law that allows them to do that. Any cannabis plant grown for this purpose must be specifically designated by the cultivator such that a board designee can readily identify which plants are being grown for personal use if the plants are at or near a cultivator's physical site of operations. Physical site of operations is itself a defined term that basically just says, you know, where your establishment is, where you're actually growing the plants for the market. Uh, if they're not near there, then it doesn't really matter. But if they are, you need to designate them. Um, no plants grown for per no plant grown for personal use may supply cannabis to the regulated market, and cannabis grown for personal use must not be entered into the inventory tracking system. So a couple changes here to the manufacturer packaging. Again, we're adding in license number and process lot number for packaging that's gonna go to a consumer. Also adding a couple more warnings here. Um, so warning spe specific to solid concentrates. Um, <clears throat> Use with caution, exceeding recommended serving size can have severe adverse effects. Vape oil cartridges, Use of caution to avoid overconsumption, start, sl start low and go slow. And then a new subsection related to disposable vape pens, which will prohibit the use of disposable vape pens. So disposable vape pens or other disposable va vaping devices are prohibited. Um, disposable vape pens are all-in-one pre-charged vape pens that are not intended for multiple uses and that can be used for e-liquids, oils, extracts, or distillates. So this section here, this is this is packaging requirements for interest supply chain. No, so interest supply chain is is up um, up here. So interest supply chain is much less onerous. We can go back to two point two point nine a. Right. Oh, that's all right. And on the pre-charged disposable vape pens. This is something that I know was brought before us when we originally wrote our rules. Then it kind of got lost in the shuffle of everything we were trying to accomplish. I right. here. I've had a number of people ask me about them <clears throat> as we've opened. <clears throat> I think it fits with the culture of our our packaging and what we're trying to accomplish that you know, disposable vape pens, some are, most are plastic, some metal, but you know, they're, they're thrown away quickly and if we can reuse those batteries as much as we possibly can i think it's it's better for our waste systems right 
And yeah, just to remind per Pepper's question <clears throat> a second ago, just to remind everybody, um, this this long list is for packaging that will ultimately be the packaging that a consumer sees when they purchase a product. Interest supply chain packaging is much more basic. Those requirements are in 2.2.9. Same change as before here, just clarifying that um, samples can go to another licensee instead of naming the specific license types. This is just a clarification. Section 2.5.1 said that all doors have to be locked at all times, which obviously doesn't make sense for a retailer. So just noting that retailers can have unlocked doors to the extent necessary to allow customer access. Just change the title here to make it clear that it's not all age verification in this section. There's a couple things about personal information at the bottom. I don't know why that changed. Let's see. So we didn't previously have a sample section for employees of retailers because <clears throat> under the original legislation, retailers couldn't do packaging. That has changed, they can. So in accordance with that change to make it all even across the playing field here, um, retailer employees can access samples just like uh, employees of other license types can. I changed this to display samples just because there's a lot of confusion about people thinking that consumer samples were about handing out samples directly to consumers. That really wasn't what was intended here. This was about like having samples in jars that people could um, view or smell. I don't know if this makes it any better, but hopefully it's a little less confusing. <clears throat> and then just putting in that clones will be, um, the board will have some regulations about that, but we're gonna do it by guns. A number of changes have happened to the testing section. And again, these is very much in the nature of a lot of the changes as I've talked about before, where we're really just trying to put into rule how the board has been applying these rules already. Um, so the flowchart that started this all out uh, has changed significantly. <clears throat> A lot of it will be explained in guidance as that second sentence says. Um, so you'll see a very, well, to those of you who have been working in this, this isn't a new flowchart because this is the flowchart that is in our guidance. Um, it is quite different than the one that was than the chart that was previously in this rule, but it is not new. It is the one that is in the guidance and that's being sort of followed and applied uh, by our compliance team already. And this is the old deleted, almost entirely eliminated. There is one note that I think is repeated in here, which is that um, testing for other contaminants may be deemed necessary at the board's discretion. Moisture parameters, <clears throat> they're not, although the specifics are deleted, they're not being eliminated. We're just moving them to guidance in the same way that we put in guidance almost all the other parameters. And this is essentially just a restatement of what was already there, which is that pesticides have to follow, use of pesticides has to follow the rules that are um, already in force. Um, and have been adopted and are maintained by the Agency of Agriculture. Just noting that labs have to maintain their certification there. This is really a technical change just to make sure this, this section agrees with the change in rule one that says that sometimes we aren't gonna require a full renewal for changes in control. And then I'll finish it out and then come back to this waiver provisions piece. <clears throat> um, the only other change here is just shortening this time for um, where the board will basically deem that a local control commission has made a decision uh, in terms of, and, and the board will deem it, will deem local control licenses to have been granted if they haven't heard anything within 45 days. Um, that could go longer if there is clear communication about a process that's in that's occurring 
um, around the local control licensing. But if there's really no communication at all, it'll be a 45 day um, time period. Have we had any issues with that to date? What are there like 19 local control commissions or? I don't, don't there, there have been a lot of, there has been a lot of confusion generally around the local control process. I don't think the timeline has been a particular issue. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back and did, sorry, did you want did you want to do this one too, or were there I mean, fewer? Maybe generally good practice if my colleagues want to look at this one as well to just sure, see if sure. this is what we want to. Wait. I didn't have any suggestions for wait, for changing this particular piece. I know a lot of these, or at least a couple of these, were uh, energy related. Mm -hmm. It's important for everybody listening here that on re-licensure, if you're an indoor cultivator, a lot of these energy waivers will go away and you need to start thinking about that. And I think we'll be in communication with those folks in the near future. Um, I don't know, I don't really have a strong feeling either way if we wanna keep some of these waivers in for folks in year one who might be a new like indoor cultivator or do we think we've moved as, as a critical mass enough folks over to kind of Asking folks to start their indoor grow without these waivers. I don't really have a good answer for that at this point in time, but, yeah. but I, I don't know if I want to change any anything today. It's something we can consider as we move through this process. I don't think, yeah. Like I said, I didn't have any any of these that I specifically thought we needed to look at, but generally good practice unless. Yeah. I'll just run through them then. Yeah. And <clears throat> If something pops into your mind, you can say something. So this first one is the um, just the standard operating procedure manuals. We're saying that doesn't have to happen for tier one cultivators. <clears throat> oh, whoops. So that one, 2.2.4 A, B, and C had some um, exemptions there. Yeah, I think those are fine. Yeah, I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Go to 2.2.5. One in five. So yeah, exempting them from some of the procedural requirements here in the cash handling. Yep, makes sense. Right, sorry, the training. Again, you know, folks are looking to move up tier. I think it, it makes sense to have our tier one folks thinking about those things well, in light of getting smarter as as business professionals. But I see the need to change that. Yep. And I think this one, this was J, right? Yeah, so this one was really saying that, look, if you're a tier one, I think the idea here was that a lot of these are going to be sole proprietors. It's not possible to have right. transportation happening, and also it's going to be one person doing it. <clears throat> um, to allow some flexibility around staying close to the vehicle. 2.3.2. Oh, this is a way of staying. This is 2. <clears throat> okay, so another uh, just protocol exemption there around the safety call. Mm -hmm. And again, doesn't exempt them from all the other pieces of that, the visitor thing, just saying that the written protocol isn't necessary. And then this whole section was exempted. Um, 
for home occupancy businesses. <clears throat> and that's still which I think is just going to be the case, but yeah. as I understand it. 2.5.6 B and C. And then this is what Kyle, I think you were talking about earlier uh, around some of the energy requirements. And this is for B and C for these. And that's it. So unless there's any other stuff, that those are all the waivers, two one waivers. I think we're good. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. So that's rule two. And then we only have one other rule. We're going to hold on rule three because there is a good chance that there's good, that the legislature is really going to revisit the medical program. Um, so it didn't, there was vi like really minimal changes that had come up for rule three. So it made more sense to wait on the legislative action and then rework rule three as necessary to be in compliance with whatever the legislature may do this coming session. Yeah, I mean, I think all the changes that folks may want to see with the medical program, and I think we, to some extent, want to see with the medical program. <laughs> We're bound on rule three also by that whatever we do with medical program can be no more restrictive than the exit pre-existing rule. So right. unless that changes, there's not a lot that we can do to rule three. That's exactly right. We are largely stuck on rule three. I think um and yeah, another reason to let the legislature make some changes and perhaps reconsider that or define that in a way that makes more sense and we can the board can figure that out. So there's actually only one change to rule four, so I'm not going to scroll through the whole thing. I'm just going to skip right to the single change, which is that we are putting in rule the administrative appellate process, and this refers to the process that happens if somebody disagrees with the final decision of the board and wants to appeal it up above the board. So basically, you know, we make a bunch of decisions, um, have a lot of authority to do that, but if somebody doesn't like one of our decisions, there is a mechanism to ask a higher authority to check that. And the legislation, the legislature said that the way that's going to happen for the board is that an administrative appellate officer is the one that's going to hear those appeals initially. Um, so this is the process by which those appellate um, appeals will happen. Uh, the other state entity or one of the other state entities where this happens is the Office of Professional Responsibility. And these are so we really are queuing closely to the rules that they use in adopting this. Um, and I should also note and clarify that these processes are in force right now. Um, this is the process that will be used for any appeals that are currently have been noticed with the executive director and are going to be ongoing in the coming months. Um, they've been adopted as a matter of policy by the board, uh, but we thought it made sense to just stick them in the rule as well uh, to make sure that there's sort of maximum clarity about what the process will be. And I won't read through all of that. It's not particularly exciting or relevant to the actual business of running a cannabis establishment. Um, but these will be posted in probably within the week and uh, you can read through it if you're curious. Um, and that's it. Awesome. Thank you, David. Thank you. Okay. Um, just a final reminder that this is the very beginning of the rule amendment process. Um, this is the very first step in it. Um, we will take extensive public comment on any other rules that need to change or any of these proposed changes um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, but why don't we continue down the agenda? Um, Bryn, um, if you have the recommendations for placement. Yep, I do. Okay.
say that. <laughs> okay, so here is um, this week's register for the adult use um, applications and the patient program or the medical program also. So this, um, the data that is sh is being shown in this register is for the last two weeks since we missed a board meeting. We skipped a board meeting last week for the holiday. <clears throat> so starting with the medical cannabis program in the last two weeks, um, we received about um, <clears throat> 300, a little bit over 300 renewal applications. Um, I'm sorry, 170, not 300. 170 renewal applications, 61 patient applications, issued 150 patient cards. Um, this is a this is basically on par with um, the number of applications that we've been receiving in the last several weeks. Um, so it seems like big numbers, but um, since it's two, it accounts for two weeks, so it's about the same as what we've been getting um, each week. Medical staff are um, processing applications received on and after October 28th. So we are very nearly within our 30 day window. <clears throat> Move on to the adult um, adult use license applications data. Put it all on one page. Um, in the last two weeks, um, we've received about 35 new employee ID card applications and um, seven cannabis establishments. Um, and those seven applications, two of them are for manufacturing licenses, four of them are for small cultivation licenses, and one um, is for a retail license. And speaking of retail licenses, um, here's our list of the location of retail licensees and applicants for a retail license that are in the queue. Um, so we've gone up, this total number has gone up by one in the last two weeks. Um, the latest applicant for a retail license um, is in Burlington. Um, so that increases our total number um, of retail licensees and retail applicants in the Burlington, um, in the city of Burlington to eight. Um, so a little flag for the board. Um, and also today we issued our 25th um, retail license. So <clears throat> that's a good milestone. Um, I will move on to our list of recommendations for a cannabis establishment license. Um, as always, these applicants um, have demonstrated compliance with all of the requirements for their license that are set forth in statute and rule. So this week we have Highly Rooted applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license, Bliss Point Chocolate applying for a Tier 1 manufacturing license, Tier Nanog Edibles applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license, Green Queen Incredible Edibles, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. The Tea House, applying for a retail license. Border Town Apothecary, applying for a Tier 1 manufacturing license. Sleeper's Garden, applying for an indoor Tier 1 cultivation license. And Cambridge Cannabis Company, applying for a retail license. That is your group that the staff is recommending for um, approval for licensure this week. Our new license amendments in the last two weeks. Um, and we do have one new social equity applicant in the queue as of this week. All right. Any questions for Bryn? Nope. All right. Is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations? I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented to us by staff in this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. All right. Great work. Um, let's uh, shift to public comment. Um, if you'd like to make a public comment, join via the video link. Please just raise your virtual hand and we will do our best to call on you in the order that you raise your hand. And then we'll move to people that join via the phone. Alice, Alice. do you want to get us started? Yeah, hi. 
Um, I'm, I guess I have two comments um, just that I picked out. I'm not sure how concerned I am about these two things yet. Um, the first thing that I'm a little concerned about is the allowance of lighting for outdoor um, cultivators, um, extra lighting so that they can have it during a time where they want to uh, keep their, their plants in the right, um, I'm going to say format, but that's a computer term, um, in the right um, place um, for cultivation. Now, one of the things in my town, Waitsfield, is that we have some significant lighting requirements and ordinances and regulations. And the select board, the planning commission, and residents in general are concerned about light pollution. And this is one of the things that was talked about immediately um, with indoor cultivation. We have a um, botanical vegetable grower here that has quite a significant indoor cultivation that's in like the type of um, um, structure that really, it really lights up at night and causes light pollution. And it's really a uh, talking point. Um, so one of the things we'd be concerned about moving forward is how much more light pollution or lighting that this requires. We also, because of this, have some strict regulations on the brightness of lighting allowed, the lumens, and the type of lighting required. We require downward facing illumination. And that type of illumination can wind up being more expensive for the user um, than just putting up lights, any kind of lights in general. So that, that's just a comment I wanted to make on light pollution and allowing more um, outdoor lighting. Um, the other one I'm kicking around in my head now is the water and wastewater. Um, letters that you're now going to require that, um, I guess it's mostly going to be growers that would have enough water for their um, growing. Our, um, cultiv our cultivators are going to be out in our ag res district where we don't have um, public water utility or a waste public wastewater utility. Um, so that's not something we could accommodate anybody who's cultivating in our ag res district. And we don't plan on bringing those services there. In our uh, business district, um, looking at the location of where our uh, businesses are going to be, um, we could, they're all on the public water utility. So our water commission could accommodate them they're probably gonna roll their eyes at me when I tell them they need to do this for the user. But I just wanted to make that comment about water and wastewater. Um, moving forward, yeah, I don't see any cultivation happening anywhere other than ag res where there are no utilities. So I guess they would need to go to the DEC permitting for that to see what their water capability and or wastewater capability. And that's it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alice. <clears throat> it's always nice having someone with some municipal background uh, tuning in to help us think through these things. We will certainly take those comments under consideration. Okay. Dave. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dave Chair for his uh, service to uh, the stakeholders uh, of, of the cannabis community. Um, I was really sad to hear that Dave found a really great job that's even better than this one. Um, and uh, he'll be missed. Um, bye, Dave. Really enjoyed working with you. <laughs> um, that's out of the bag now, Dave. 
Well, I mean, you posted his job, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, lots covered today, and, you know, we'll definitely get you lots of comments once we uh, have some time to review the the, the red lines. Um, but uh, some, some things that come to mind um, as, as kind of high level and big impact. Um, as, as you make any changes to packaging, you know, packaging has been, labeling uh, has been um, really hard um, for a lot of licensees. Um, and a lot of licensees have invested heavily uh, in purchasing packaging and labels that comply with your current rules. Um, and it would be, I think, unfair uh, to make them throw away uh, their existing inventory. So as you're thinking about changing those things, and, and look, I mean, the health warning is, is not good. So it needs change. Um, but as, as you think about, you know, changing those things and adding new terms, you know, previously the health warning had to be in the marketing layer. Now it has to be on the interior layer, you know, when this rule goes into effect, that, that you allow people to use things that were produced prior to the effective date of the rule change um, or, or even the publication date of the rule change. Right. So that we're not, you know, you're not incentivizing us to go and rush in a bunch of, uh, of orders in advance. Right. Um, but you know, th there are, there have been tens and tens of thousands of dollars invested in complying with your existing labeling rules, um, which are difficult to comply with. Uh, also adding the words and pets to the 10 point font bold, uh, disclosure, um, may make it difficult to fit that thing on many packages. Um, let, let come to the shop. Um, let, let me show you some packaging um, and 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 how it's difficult to already difficult to squeeze all this stuff in. Um, so making thing making that line in particular longer is 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 problematic. Um, and and the thing about um, disposable vapes. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, you know, given the um, the position the board has taken on, you know, sort of the environmental impact uh, and the plastics ban, it's it's certainly consistent and it's not surprising. Um, but these are products that are sold um, in Massachusetts. They will be sold uh, across the lake in New York. Um, they're popular products. They're convenient products for tourists. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, you're putting some of the retailers, especially in border communities, um, at a significant disadvantage. Um, and I, I think your licensees in places like Bennington and Brattleboro are, in particular, going to be hurt by this. Um, they're already struggling to compete, or will be struggling to compete as they get open um, with their um, Massachusetts uh, existing Massachusetts market participants. Um, that um, you know, don't have the 50 milligram per package limit, don't have the plastic span, um, and are able to sell vape products. So um, just please give some thought to that and, and the, the economic sustainability uh, of, of market participants, particularly, you know, in border communities. Um, more to come in writing. Thank you very much for all your work. And uh, again, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Chris. Hi, guys. Chris Preston from Cambridge Cannabis Company. Uh, just wanted to take the time to thank you for uh, what you guys do and appreciate everything. So looking forward to, um, you know, jumping into the legal market. Thank you again. Thank you. Congrats. You're not all gettables. Um, hi, uh, this is Robin Tiernan on Edibles. I just wanted to jump in and say uh, thank you for uh, issuing us our license today. I really look forward to working with everybody here. And um, while I'm at it, I, I'd really like to second uh, what Mr. Silverman said about the uh, changes to packaging. And, uh, you know, if I know for us personally, it's like a five-week lead out anytime we get something printed. And 
honestly, it's tens of thousands of dollars at a time. And it would really, really hurt us in our growing business if we had to toss all that to get new stuff printed. But that being said, thank you so much for everything and uh, look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Congrats. Anyone else um, who joins uh, by video, just feel free to raise your virtual hand if you want to make a public comment. And if you join via phone, um, you can hit star six to unmute your phone if you'd like to make a comment. Ernie is first. Hello. Um, I just have a question about the document that um, you guys opened the meeting with today, um, specifically just the line about um, agreements and cultivators being allowed to make an agreement such as putting their label on for them. Um, can you, is that a financial agreement? And uh, if it is, will the CCB be issuing any guidance on how a separate financial licensing agreement should accompany a cannabis transaction? Um, I'm just curious about as a manufacturing applicant, like I'm going to be applying for a manufacturing license and typically, you know, um, doing <laughs> water extracts, it's toll processing by strain for the cultivator. And generally the cultivator wants that product back because the concentrate is a direct representation of the flower that they grew. Um, and you can say that about gummies that, you know, are made by preserving terpenes and, you know, you're running with strain batches and stuff. So I, I get that based on legislation, the cultivator is not allowed to possess this, but I'm curious, like, if the cultivator and the manufacturer enter an agreement where the manufacturer is going to sell that product for the cultivator and then pay them on the back end based on what they were able to sell it for, is that legal? Because the cultivator is technically earning off of the sale of a product that they're not allowed to possess without sell. Um, I'm just like, where? How does this? How does this work out? Where? it happens cleanly for both the cultivator, the manufacturer, and the retailer who is the final you know, buyer within the industry. Um, I don't know if you guys have given this any thought and how easy it would be to just allow the cultivator to carry product from flour that was cultivated by them since everything's already tracked and traced. I know that you know there's a lot of room for like commentary like this in terms of rule change coming up. So I hope to be able to give further input. And uh, I know a lot of cultivators are kind of like, you know, the expectation was they would be able to transfer product back to the cultivator from the manufacturer, and that's not the case. So how can we facilitate this for small cultivators that? do not have the possibility to get a wholesaler license or a manufacturing license since they're operating out of their houses. I'm also mainly thinking of outdoor cultivators who now are like in a rush to sell all of their flour as quickly as they can because that product kind of expires as quickly as, you know, it's the fastest to expire. Whereas, you know, if they were farmers for, meat, for example, they would send the meat to the butcher and they could freeze the meat and sell it throughout the rest of the year, et cetera. Um, I really appreciate you guys listening to this. And, uh, you know, I hope that there is room for discussion and I'm, you know, hope to see you guys internally discuss this just to consider the effects that this has on specific, specifically tier one cultivators and outdoor cultivators. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Bernie. <clears throat> yeah, we'll um, we'll keep this conversation going, especially as the legislature comes back into town and we are amending our rules to see what makes the most sense. Austin. Hi. Yeah. Um, I find the uh, guidance documents uh, really helpful. And uh, I thank you for those. And I was hoping that 
Uh, we could get one on the product registration process and like expectations and timelines and stuff like that, just like the uh, application ones. Um, all right, thank you. That was my comment. Thank you. Anyone else with a public comment? Just either hit star six to unmute your phone or raise your virtual hands. Bobby. Yes, thank you for all you guys do. I have a simple question, kind of a high level. We hear about New York being flooded with flowers, and I know you're giving out a lot of um, uh, cultivation um, tier ones. And are we concerned about being over flooded? I mean, when is our stopping point? I don't know if we have any. I'm just a little concerned about entering the market where there's so much going, you know, being produced already, and maybe there is a market for mine. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Um, yeah. Any, anyone else? All right, I will close the public comment window. Um, just on that last point, I would just say we do have um, a very sophisticated market analysis tool that's available on our website for download. Um, it shows what the supply and demand is likely to look like uh, based upon our current number of licensees. You can plug that in and see how that changes. Um, you know, there's a lot of adjustable assumptions that are in that document where you can change things like, you know, market share of edibles or flour and see how that affects price points and things like that. Um, so I would encourage anyone um, who has the patience to deal with it, to download it and, and play around with it and see how um, the people that we're licensing might affect um, the supply and demand and the price of cannabis. Most complex Excel sheet I've ever had the privilege of playing with. But I think we're we're in pretty good shape in the market. Yeah. Um, so David, I forgot when we were in that section of our agenda, if we wanted to vote to pre-file. Um, I mean, you should vote to yes. And right. just to clarify again, in case it bears repeating, it's just like this vote is simply saying you approve these initial proposed rules and you think they're ready to be pre-filed with the amendments you discussed around the rule waivers in rule one for mm -hmm. tier one cultivators. And I'll make those changes as you discuss them. Um, so I'd note that when you make a motion. And then this will give me the go ahead to pre-file and start the process. And then the pre-file process, you don't have to give me the exact timelines, but that's an initial filing and there's a public comment window. And then we make amendments based on those public comments. And then we file with that's a, exactly ICAR. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's the summary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the the there's a couple filings that happen and then that public comment period opens, like I was saying before, probably late January. So then is there a motion to uh, pre-file rules one, two, and four um, with the amendments shown today um, and discussed in our meeting? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, okay, uh, that's it. Um, and uh, I think I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for joining and sticking with us and we'll see you next week.